Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Sprangers and I'm the founder of Glamhive. And I'm so happy to have three amazing people with me today to talk about diversity in fashion and the fashion industry. Um, starting with Mecca Cox, I met Mecca when I was kind of just starting Glamhive and she was one of the first stylists who kind of said yes to the vision that I had about what we were building. Um, we met at the Soho House in LA. I just was always so grateful for you for saying yes so early on. And then I met Jean, I think I spoke with you, Jean Yang, about maybe six months ago or before we were gonna do our first event. And so I was so delighted to meet you because you're such a powerhouse in the industry and also a celebrity stylist. And then a few weeks ago, I was reading the New York Times in the style section, and there was an article um, that I read, like I do every Sunday, but it was the June 24th headline, it's time to end, end racism in the fashion industry, but how? And one of the people that was quoted and participated in that article was Keyboy Chase Marshall. And so I reached out to Keyboy and he has been so amazing to be part of this panel and talk with me about the Kelly Initiative and his perspective on the industry. And so that's the hope for this conversation today that as leaders in the industry, you can shed light on kind of where it's been, where it's, where it's going and, and solutions that you have for how to, how to improve. So, um, so I'll first start by having you guys introduce yourself. So Mecca, if you could tell everyone about you, that'd be awesome. Um, I'm Mecca. I'm a stylist um, in LA currently. Um, I work mostly in music and fashion. Um, and I, I kind of started out um, on the other side of the camera. I started out as a model in my like younger life and then kind of grew up doing that for like 10 years probably and then got into styling after that. So I've kind of been on like both sides of the, um, of the industry in a way. And, um, you know, I think there are things on, uh, there are things about that experience that, um, kind of inform the way I see all of this and, and like the ways to like move forward and, um, that are productive, I guess. I love that. And Jean? So I started off actually thinking that I was going to go into law, uh, hated it. And the only reason I was going into law was because I wanted to go into politics. And I chose the path of um, pretty Washington, D.C., which is Hollywood. So I worked mm -hmm. at a clothing line for a second. We created one of the first fashion websites in the world. Realized I really enjoyed styling. Got into doing music videos. Um, did mainly boy bands. And I think it kind of taught me how to do, you know, anything. Because when you end up doing 500 extras for a music video and you only have about 30 minutes to get everybody dressed you just learn how to like work on the fly so then i started working right to the inception of what celebrity styling was uh working on like the matrix and oceans and um and from there i've basically become a big i mean a men's big men stylist i work mainly with males celebrities doing press tours uh, red carpet, and um, in between, I did have a clothing line uh, with Katie Holmes, and uh, you know, showed at Fashion Week and learned a lot from that. Uh, mm -hmm. Thankfully, uh, we put a pin in it and said, "Look, let's hold off on doing this," and it was really all encompassing. And so that's what I've been up to. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. And Keyway, this is fascinating. I love learning about the other panelists. Um, I come from a uniquely sort of hybrid professional background. I began my career working as an apparel and accessories designer on 7th Avenue in collection level studios. Um, I worked for the first sort of three years of my design career for Michael Kors and sort of cut my teeth in that American sportswear driven vocabulary and went on to work for other sort of brands that shared some overlap. So I worked for Isaac Mizrahi and I worked for Oscar de la Renta in the design studio. I then worked uh, for a Gap Inc. Uh, sub brand and that was my first foray into mass market design. Um, and I was with them for about two years and change before 
heading to um, Jay Mandel, where I learned a great deal about uh, outerwear and working with uh, fur of a myriad of uh, um, sensibilities. Uh, and at that point, I sort of was at the 10 year mark of having worked as an apparel designer and feeling that a lot of my creative expression was always being um, filtered through the lens of the brand for which I was working. And I didn't really have enough of my own um, sensibilities and perspectives. So I returned to undergrad study, which I had left to accept a role at Michael Kors. And um, I got a degree in modern culture and media, um, which really primed me to become that much more receptive to the work that film, television, literature, creative arts plays in inspiring um, designers. Uh, over the next 10 years, I would work in digital media as an editor and market editor, as well as in a com consulting capacity for emerging brands that um, often apply me to both developing product and working on the marketing of that product. So within the last two years, I have pivoted somewhat into advocacy um, in black fashion professionals, most specifically those within the design studio. First with a campaign called Break Silence, Break Ceilings in 2018, and more recently with a campaign called the Kelly Initiative um, that occurred within the last uh, two months. Yeah, that's amazing. So I'll kind of go back to, to frame the conversation, but again, the New York Times, you know, they're a big article in the style section, really the headline, it's time to end racism in the fashion industry, but how? And so how do you think the industry needs to change? And I'll start with Mecca, with you. Um, I think that there's been a lot of um, strides made in terms of like, you know, like the front facing part of fashion in terms of like models and inclusivity when it comes to, um, not with everyone of course, but certainly there's been a lot of strides made toward having inclusivity in the front facing part of people's brands. Um, I think that what's lacking is um, the behind the scenes part and the fact that a lot of, um, you know, consultants, design teams, um, are, are still kind of still look the same while um, the front of the company is changing the back of the company is saying the same and I think I don't want to like minimize the fact that models of all colors are being included in shows and in campaigns because that means something and that's important and I um, you know I was reading something today actually where someone was posting about um, uh, Jacques and Mou's show which just happened the other day and about how they have so much inclusivity on the runway. But then when you see the team that's actually working there, everyone is white, which I mean, I assume you couldn't really tell that well from the picture. So um, I think that was the conclusion they were drawing. Um, and the comment about it was that having it be mostly about models is performative activism, I suppose. To me, I think that's a little off base. I think it's, I don't think you can say it's performative when you're including models, because I think there was a long time when models were not part of that conversation at all. I think there was a lot, there's been, and actually I listened to a whole conversation with Beth Ann Hardison about how, you know, there's been these like long periods of like decades sometimes where there are no black models in any campaigns or on any runways and how they've been working. Her and Naomi Campbell have a, initiative to kind of change that and they have changed that for the most part so I don't want to say that that's performative I think that it's like an important step I just think we now need to like move on to the next step as well and think about how a lot of the brands that are making these mistakes in terms of PR and doing things that they claim they don't know are racist like Gucci or Prada or I mean even with all the ways that people were addressing um, you know police brutality and um, and, and racism maybe like within the fashion industry with like the black box and all the stuff on social media and a lot of brands are doing that wrong as well. I think all of that speaks to the fact that they don't have 
any black people actually working at the brand. Because if there was any black person there that ran, that saw any of these things before they came out, it would be really easy for someone to say like, oh no, don't say that, or it's not about that, or that's not really the right way, maybe there's another way. And so I think a lot of brands are making the mistake of trying to go it alone and just start to do the work that they don't totally know how to do, but they may have the intention there. But the fact is you really just need to be having representation behind the scenes of your brand. If you're gonna have inclusivity on the runway, there needs to be inclusivity in your design team and your business, the business part of your team. And, you know, I mean, if, I think if you do that, you start to realize that you'll make a lot less mistakes and you won't have to be constantly cleaning things up or constantly trying to struggle to figure things out. And to me, it just seems so simple. So I'm not really sure why people aren't doing that. I mean, even to the extent of just hiring cons um, consultants, if it's not, you know, um, if people aren't ready to fully take on like a new team or whatever. I mean, there's so many ways that you could implement these changes. So I'm not sure. I think people are still very resistant and still want to do things the same way, but also be doing it right. And those two things just don't work together. So I think it's about taking like a comprehensive look at your entire brand and not just the way the brand looks to the outside world. Mecca raises some really valid points about the ways in which the industry can really vest in veneers. And some people would say that's the nature of an image-driven industry. That said, I think the industry, um, as of recent, has had to grapple with the ways in which creative fields can't sit out of the socio-political dialogue in the contemporary era. Um, especially because many of the disenfranchised communities that were often given no spaces of leadership previously, now we, we feel as a culture that, that that's not acceptable. Um, I think that the work that Beth Ann Hardison and Naomi Campbell and Iman uh, did with Balanced Diversity to name and shame brands into using more um, diverse castings was monumental and it was a paradigm shift. Um, that resulted in brands like Celine that seemed so resistant to making their runways more reflective of the community of consumers that purchased their product. It made them shift. And a company like Celine putting black, dark-skinned women with natural close-cropped hair on the runway, we watched as that pivoted industry towards a greater spectrum of representation. I think, though, the industry is playing a very uh, deceptive game of relying upon the public's lack of visibility within brands to masquerade as though the outward projection is an embodiment of the inward ethos. And that's where I have to take the industry to task, first of all, by saying that um, it is past due for fashion industry uh, mainstream brands to release demographic data about who is comprising the companies. In tech, mm -hmm. in other industries, that is standard as a means of having informed discussions about diversity and inclusion. You need that raw data. And the fashion industry is playing this game of hide and seek in regard to people discerning that that element is necessary to have the conversation. And then I would also say that those who find that they are making inroads in pursuit of equity in places like models on runways, in editorial, um, and for other uh, bookings, they need to link arms with the communities of Black professionals that are, as Mecca put it, are not as public facing. Um, they need to pull those uh, struggles into the work they're doing and, and speak about how, as models, they feel that if they were more equitably being assessed with teams that reflected the public, they would work more consistently because these things do go in trends. There are, you know, fits and spurts of the use of Asian models, of 
models of all different ethnicities, but what we're trying to ultimately realize is casting and companies that look like the consumer public. And that shouldn't be a, a trend ever. It's interesting because I've seen, you know, as, as somewhat of a senior person in this business, I come from the world of not seeing anybody who wasn't blonde, blue eyed in every magazine cover to seeing people of every size, every color on the representations of, I mean, uh, basically what society deemed as beautiful people, right? I mean, I've seen a huge shift. I definitely think most recently, um, it was one of my daughters was talking to somebody and we noticed on their TikTok that they put up something that I considered somewhat racist and my daughter was really kind of surprised. And this is an individual that co-ops everything about Black America. I mean, literally from their street, streetwear looks to the music. And I, my daughter said, I am so shocked that you're this person who outwardly tries to pretend and co-opt everything about Black Americans, and yet you will not support the BLM movement. And I said, Sydney, that's always been, you know, to my daughter, I was like, this has sadly been always something that has happened, where people in fashion, in music, will co-opt a subculture, whether it is, you know, queer culture where, you know, you saw voguing become popular or you see streetwear becoming popularized. And in many ways, <clears throat> it's good to know that we've pushed and it's important that um, you need to have people on the side that are pushing for even more. But then you also need to have people who acknowledge to a certain extent that we've made strides. And yes, I mean, to be able to see people of all different colors and races and different, I mean, hopefully next different sizes on the runway, it will be, you know, it's important. And I love that really to a certain extent, the younger generation is pushing for the extremes. It's kind of the same thing in, in politics, like where you see AOC really pushing for like the most progressive movement but then you also have people in the middle who are saying, okay, great, wonderful. Let's not throw away everything. At least you finally are getting people. Um, it, there is a certain amount of public shaming that occurred years ago when people were using people in Vietnam and in third world countries for props, speaker companies. And so a lot of those companies ended up getting people in who came in and their job was to go in and visit these companies to make sure that people were being treated ethically. Oh, you're talking about labor. Labor, exactly. Yes. So, oh, gotcha. so what's interesting is that because, you know, generally I am probably going to be a lot more conscious about the way in which, and I think most people are more and more conscious about the way they and what, what they choose to purchase because your dollar is, you know, to a certain extent, an acceptance of what these people's practices are. Mm -hmm. I'd like to think that the next step is, okay, that's being produced ethically. The next thing is, yes, we need to have another person being hired that, not just one person, I guess, but I think there needs to be a reflection of your potential customers, of what is right and wrong. The fact that, I mean, these glaring examples of what happened with H&M or what's happened with Prada or Gucci are so shocking to me. They're so shocking to all of us, right? And it's, it seems like, how could you have even considered producing that? I think that one of the ways in which the conversation about inclusion gets obscured is the age old rhetoric, especially in an American sort of dialogue about affirmative action. And there's this assumption that non-traditional candidates don't bring industry competitive skills. And I maintain that that is one of the ways in which these conversations get mired in this notion that the bottom line will suffer for companies that have diverse teams, that ultimately the level of product will be compromised. And it erases the talent pool of dynamic, accomplished, skilled candidates that come from non-traditional backgrounds. It allows them to be put out to pasture 
far before Prime. Uh, and what I maintain is that that is not by accident, that is deliberate. Because when, those, when that talent pool is allowed to be present in industry, it changes the ecosystem, it redistributes power. They are more present in conversations that they've traditionally been left out of. And they, they begin to, to wield influence and they, they change the narrative going forward. And so uh, I constantly try to redirect this conversation to not erasing that talent pool. Because I think what we find is that when and if people defy um, convention, they really can shift a dialogue indefinitely. So if you consider the ways in which Alexander Wang as a designer is one of the first American, Asian American designers to not be inherently associated with Asian or Asian American aesthetic. He designed clothing for hot young things in America and was very successful. And that I think shifted a lot of dialogues around because before that you had sort of the Vivian Tam sort of paradigm of I engage my specific cultural heritage in the work I do and it pigeonholed many Asian American designers. But think about the ways in which, you know, post Alexander Wang, you have, there's been an opening up of ability to see Asian designers outside of referencing traditional Asian culture. Um, and I'm not saying he's the only one, but I think he's a key example. I think it's those paradigm shifts and those redistributions of power that many people in industry fear. Mm. So it's very interesting because I used to work with a Google executive who mm -hmm. was there at the inception. And one of the first things that they required when they were hiring people was their SAT and IQ were the only requirements for who they hired. Consequently, they dismally failed, almost went out of business in the beginning. Mm. What then became one of the requirements, which changed the ent entire trajectory of Google, was that they wanted to hire people who at least had spent a year to two years in a country of an origin that they did not speak the language. Mm. What that did was, one of the things that they were looking for was when you become beholden to other people, you develop an incredible emotional intelligence. And as a result, you are much more aware of what other people want, need, require, desire. It literally changed the entire business and Google has become, you know, it would not have been what it was in terms of a search engine, right? Mm -hmm had it not been able to understand the needs of a variety of different people, not just Sergey, you know, one of the, the founders. So it's interesting to me because right now, <clears throat> when I look at what's happened with the desires and, and, and to a certain extent, what we consider cool, there's been such an incredible diversification. It's not like the one shoe or the one look, which became very, I mean, I went through those. I mean, those trends were what was important. And I always cracked up when people would ask me, oh, what is cool now? I'm like, whatever, you, whatever works for you is cool. You know, whatever is, and even the terms and, and the way that to a certain extent we have social media. And yes, there are certain things that we have as um, people that people look up to for fashion and whatnot. And there is certain problems in terms of standards of beauty that I have issues with. I'd like to think because be everything has become so much wider and because that circle is opening, it almost is, it makes economic sense for any company whatsoever. If they want to be successful, they need to do the same thing. I mean, don't you, don't you think, I mean, if you approach fashion, it, that, but in fashion, people awesome. consistently forego making money to maintain their space of comfort. People will That's everywhere. It, it it might be everywhere. To me, it's often quite egregious. In, oh yeah. In fashion, that people will say, you know, I mean, look at the ways these companies get like pulled, kicking and screaming like petulant toddlers towards like any level of atonement for the images they disseminate, and then they 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 offer the boilerplate apology and grant no visibility of who made the decisions in the first place. I mean, fashion is actually a space where people don't get let go. It's not like when, you know, certain celebrities make mistakes and they get 
fired from shows. They did not release people from the design teams at Prada or Gucci for those egregious images disseminated. That's because these are family businesses, like Prada is owned by a family, and then in turn, I mean, because look, one of the it's examples- not family, I, it's, it's, it's not like, it's not like Missoni, in other words. No, 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 I'm saying that like, these are mainly, um, they're, well, first of all, look, geographically, a lot has been in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and so, homo, homo, it's a homogeneous sort of crowd in, in Italy, I have to say, and, you know, to a certain extent in France and, and in England. Um, but one of the things that, I don't know if you guys ever watched a British baking show, because I have this geekiness, but one of the things that always really blew me away when I watched it and made me kind of sad about reality shows was that there's this diversity that exists. When you watch somebody from Pakistan, and maybe it can have something to do with uh, the imperialism of the the British government and, and the British Empire, but um, you have people from Pakistan, from Angola, you have people from so many different countries and there's such a representation of England in a proper manner. Whereas I definitely do not see that on Survivor or on an American show. We do all of this work of like, not of like not naming exactly the same anti-black racist rhetoric that informs these decisions. And that's not to say that everyone in a design studio that is void of black presence is racist, but it is to say that there there is the potential for some to be, right? Mm -hmm. And it is to also say that people of all walks of life, of all races, ethnicities in America get indoctrinated in anti-blackness. Mm -hmm. And we, we do so much work, we do so much suspension of disbelief <laughs> around the notion that what is playing out culturally, what's playing out in regard to how the police police certain bodies more than others, academic inequity, like we do so much work to ignore what is right before us. And I want to now flip things and say, make these companies do the work of quantifying how they're creating equitable inroads. Because if you show us your hiring rubric, then we should be able to say, okay, now let's send these qualified candidates and they should be able to make it through. And, oh, but you said that you're looking for people that are St. Martin's grads, but I'm seeing someone here on your team that isn't a St. Martin's grad. How did mm -hmm. they, what, what, what was their special sauce that got them through? You well, know? yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there is, I think what you, part of what you guys are both trying to say, and which I think is important to note, is that the attitude that inclusivity somehow diminishes your brand or the skill or whatever is like a complete and total fallacy. Like the fact is inclusivity supports and like helps brands. And, and, and it's not just brands. I mean, this is just true of companies in general. When you bring people in who have different uh, diversity of experience, diversity of background, whether that's race, religion, culture, um, and a lot of that bleeds into schools you've been in, um, areas you've grown up in, all that stuff serves to give you a, um, just a more interesting and creative um, outlook as, as, and if you're talking about fashion specifically, it's like, I think a lot about, um, cause I, I sort of um, wrote this thing about how I choose brands that I work with. And I always have looked at brands in terms of when I'm working with artists and stuff, I've always chosen brands that are independent, um, that are black designers, that are um, sustainable, that I like, I, I find that the more people have these um, metrics that they kind of um, use to inform their business that are not the standard, the more it actually is. Because you have people who just have different, you have designers who have different references, you've grown up with different musical inspirations, you have different, um, ways just a different lens of looking at the world through and it just creates a more interesting and diverse experience and I think that is important when you're talking about design like that's literally what this is all about this is really supposed to be all about creativity and ingenuity and thinking outside the box and 
moving forward. So if that's the point, then you need to have as much inclusivity as possible in order to make that engine keep going. And that I seems very I mean, obvious to me, but I guess it's not. And I know that people still want to keep the people around them that they're used to having. And, you know, they have very, people just, I think there's a lot of implicit bias going on. I think people just automatically think people who look like this can do this. I mean, it's the same thing with like, and I don't know if you have this experience, Jeannie, but like, I think with red carpet in uh, styling, for example, like I feel like publicists who control, because publicists control who, what stylists dress, what talent, they have this idea that only black stylists or black stylists can only style black talent and white stylists can style anyone. And so it's like that, I think that bleeds out into like so many areas, not just of fashion, but in the way the world is, but just to be specific about this, it's like, there's I so many ways that people I only thought that I could style Asian people because then I'd be only doing John Cho, but right. <laughs> look, look, this is the thing. I totally, I hear exactly what you're saying and that, I have to say that there is an experience that, look, I deal with only males. And so there is a sort of like, oh, you can't do women. Right. No, well, you know what? It's, it's a simplicity. There's actually been studies about this. And psychologists realize that people who are somewhat simple-minded, they try to pigeonhole because it makes it easier to figure things out. Right. There is something to be said for people who do not have an ability with which to stretch their minds because the fact is, is that if I'm going to go ahead and call out a brand right now that I think is doing phenomenally is, is, is Xenia. Xenia, you know, <clears throat> they were dressing Mahershala and a few other actors way before Mahershala. He had even been given his, his credit for the fantastic actor he is. Because for them, it was like, we only want to dress people of excellence. They also did a great collaboration with Jerry yeah. Lorenzo, Affair of God. Exactly. And I think he's one of the most under-acknowledged American menswear designers. His, his, the collection is everything. I mean, it's yeah. everything I want to see. But I haven't seen anything let, like that, right? Let's parse that a little bit. Let's parse how a brand like Fear of God's influence in not just the streetwear market, but the menswear market would posit a black creative so differently in the ecosystem. But I personally feel that there's a lot of erasure of his success. Jerry Lorenzo was not nominated for a menswear CFDA award. No, of I course not. I think I that, but even that, college period. Like he's not right? even in the-, the that, the, fear, that fear of God in, in seam and out seam stripes- I mean, do you know how many people were not nominated? And this is not to counter your point, this is to your point. Yeah. There's so many designers. I was like, but what, what, where's like Martine Rob? I, I want to throw like, on here so, so that it's, I want to throw on here so that it's like fro frozen in the record of this. Yeah. I feel that that fear of God inseam, outseam, striped track pant is, is part of contemporary menswear language. It literally mm -hmm. trickled down from his brand to every active brand to every discounter to target to this to it that's mm -hmm. to me that's the criteria when you say mm -hmm. is someone actually evolving the language of american sportswear and yeah. and but just, you know what it's it's more about it is more about a financial sort of stratification i mean i think it's it's more um because having spoken to people who've gone for the awards and gone and become part of the presenting crew yeah. I remember being told that it cost one hundred fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to be one of the people that's chosen. And I thought, who, who, which designers have that money to go out and do these runway shows? So to me, it's it's not just. I mean, it's totally financial. There's it, it, who who is in that circle? The girls who, between you and I, who can go ahead and hang out at those events because they're in it just to slum and hang out. And it's not really a financial difficulty to go ahead and throw down $250,000 or, you know, it, you have to be in it. I think that there's a unique hybrid, a Venn diagram hybrid space yep. where it become very problematic to industries. And that is when you are a black creative that is self-aware enough to not just be comfortable being tokenized and told what to do. 
when you are intelligent enough to use the visibility that's granted to you to move the needle in regard to discussions of your industry presence, um, you become problematic and or erased. And so when I look at a designer like Jerry Lorenzo, who is making the money, he's present at retail, you know, stores clamor to get fear of God in a way that like, oddly, like, you know, in the streetwear market, it's like Supreme, or in the designer market, it's like Dries. It's like really one of those things where he's doing a favor to these stores to deliver the assortment. But then you look as in the broader sort of editorial space, in the broader sort of just sort of industry acknowledgement space, and you're not seeing the acknowledgement. And I don't, in terms of the role, I feel like thinking of myself as like, fashions like Michael Moore or Aaron Brockovich. Like, I'm like, I, my, my role is to like, be, exactly who you are. to needle and to say like, uh, excuse me, hello, because I've, I stepped out of the likability stuff. I realized that these conversations, in order to be liked, one sacrifices often in this industry, moving the conversation forward. The minute that you start to move this conversation forward and call upon people, to be accountable, they don't like you. So I said, I have friends and family that love me. Let's move forward. And these are the spaces where I, 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 don't, I don't see it. So <laughs> can I you, like right now in the middle of the pandemic, I've had to work mm -hmm. and I've been up and down Rodeo Drive. After what happened with a variety of different designers, I still see lines. Of oh, people, yes. Of people of color out in line to purchase, you know, because yeah. there's obviously social distancing. Those lines, maybe they existed, maybe they didn't. And I feel like, is there a certain amount of the consumer that must be taken to, you know, task, task as well for, uh, over what, what you purchase? I mean, because I have to say that not everybody does Gee, care. I was at the Beverly Center one day as they were opening and I have to say, my heart dropped as I saw black and brown people in line for Gucci to open in the middle of a pandemic. And I was just like- Really? Yes, yes. Because at, 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 I had to, honestly, I'll be full disclosure, I had ordered some things that I had to pick up at Uniqlo. And I don't normally go to the Beverly Center. I was at the Beverly Center at 10, because I wanted to be in and out. I did not want to be there when there were a lot of people there. Um, so at 10.30, I was watching as people were in line to be temperature tested to get into Gucci and Vuitton and Balenciaga. But specifically, I thought to myself that there really is a, if not problematic, a specific relationship that certain consumers have with a company that is so oddly dispassionate about this moment, you know, that is still offering PR and, and manufactured tokenism. And it's, it, you know, it really- look, I gotta say that, look, I, I know the in, inner workings of what's going on at Gucci and one of the heads of their PR Mm -hmm. It's a black woman, and I've known her for years. And oh, listen, Ben Carson works for Donald Trump. I'm not saying that she's necessarily Ben Carson, but I'm saying that just because it's not about just black people, it's about intention and, oh, who, no, I, I, and who gets in. No, of course. I'm saying that when she goes out there and does her outreach, and then same thing with, with Zania or any of the other companies, I know, by the way, and specifically to Zania, there is a Korean woman who's in charge of her PR and she specifically targeted and went after certain people, once again, that were like, it's about excellence. Mind you, coming from her Korean eye, it was not the exclusionary view of, you know, I'm not gonna even consider that person, but it, it does make a difference. And same thing with, with Gucci, to have somebody whose eye is that of a, a you know, a black, woman, black young woman was like, I want to look after these specific people because m the movies that I'm going to see are going to be probably selected differently from that of anybody else. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just saying that I know that it, it comes from, if, if it's representation, it's really about who you choose to dress, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that the industry yeah. is vested in this notion of like being, like I say, dragged, kicking and screaming to inclusivity. I'm just looking for the industry to get to objectivity because I, I know the talented black professionals and I know the talented professionals that aren't read as slim. And I know the talented professionals who aren't read as young. I, I know all of the talented, or I know a spectrum of talented professionals who all have something that's keeping them from being given the opportunity to really not just like realize their creative potential, but move industry forward, especially American fashion that has been stuck in a non-creative merchant driven rut for a decade, you know, like, but uh, honestly, can I tell you in terms of the merchandising that would kill me? I worked on a huge company campaign. Mm -hmm. One of the most gigantic things that I'd ever worked on. And they did 21 meetings about merchandising something to the point where they showed me pants and we narrowed it down after 25 different styles to this, the most horrifically unattractive Babe, piece, right? A modified, moderate piece of banal nonsense, yes. Exactly. <laughs> and this is that we bought into that. We yeah. bought, the buyers were like, we bought into that, so you need to market. And I said, why would you want to market the most unattractive, pared down, like everything, you had all these great, the edges, right? The edges were cool, and then we went to the middle. Yeah. Why would you do that? And I realized it's because you have people beating down, like with a hammer, anything that has any flavor or anything. It's like, yeah. I don't understand that. And I think that there's a, mount, a certain amount of corporization where, gosh, why, why? It's this fear. Oh, American fashion has suffered for becoming, and this isn't to say that merchants are inherently bad, but American fashion has suffered for becoming merchant-driven as opposed to design-driven. Now, I think that a, in the collateral damage of that, uh, designers of all walks who bring newness and innovation often don't factor well in the American design dialogue. But I definitely think that when that, when that gets piled on with just like weird in implicit bias, as Mecca said, racism, anti-blackness, I definitely know all of those factors are what result in these patterns of an industry where there is an dis there's a disturbing lack of black presence and influence to the point where at this point, the industry is almost obligated to manufacture these veneers because if they were to release data, it would just be so apparent that there's, there's inequity in the hiring process. Okay, boy, is that part of what you're advocating is just so that, you know, because I think I kind of look at things from more of a consumer eye where you can look at the ad campaign and it does give you just across the board in fashion magazines that there is diversity. And so is that part of what you're advocating just for these companies to disclose their... Yeah, so of the company? telling initiative is really simple in its proposition and that's intentional because we we feel that there's so many ways in which these conversations can get wound in jargon that we wanted to really distill this to an actionable plan so yeah. step one is we need to pursue accountability through an industry census and that's through organizations brands institutions disclosing the racial demographics of their teams who identifies at what at what strata the next step is to pursue industry objectivity via doing an audit of the headhunting and recruitment systems that allow most designers and C-suite level execs in the fashion industry to pursue opportunities. That process is incredibly opaque. And as someone who is a designer, I would offer that it's incredibly inequitable to black professionals because optically they don't align with convention. Mm. The third thing is information is granting visibility of the data about who comprises what company, granting the public, the audience of students, the consumer public, granting them visibility. And then the last thing is talent profile amplification, selecting dynamic professionals that happen to be black that inarguably would enrich industry and, and amplifying their profiles annually because often, what allows those people to be super talented professionals doesn't work 
to amplify their profile organically in the social media milieu and in industry nowadays. So the, you know, the most talented cellist is probably not going to be the most popular kid in school. So if you're trying to, you know, have band, if you're having auditions for the, the orchestra, you're not looking to see who's getting the senior superlative of most popular. Um, but the industry has looked increasingly in the direction of almost casting for key roles. So yes, to your point, Stephanie, what we're trying to assert is that to get this conversation right, we have to move out of an optic-driven conversation to a data-driven and an action-driven conversation. And what has been the response? The response has been telling because, you know, all of us know this in our personal lives, that when you have sort of unfocused conversations that are often very emotionally driven, you can get you can get nowhere and you're not getting there fast. You can get nowhere for a long time. It seems like you're going to, when you focus in this conversation, when you bullet point it and say, I have four questions. Can you answer these four questions? The silence that can sometimes ensue can be more telling than anything else. And so we've encountered a disturbing non-response from the CFDA as we proposed the Kelly Initiative signed by 250 black fashion professionals. And we feel that at this moment, it's more important than ever to hold an organization like that accountable for their lack of response because the initiative doesn't have to be immediately adopted. But we do think that with that critical mass of informed black fashion professionals, that the initiative should be addressed by the CFD. I just still feel like it needs to still come from a consumer point of view where you, not necessarily you have to shame people, but I mean, the way that it hurt your heart to see people in line, there's a certain amount of, I don't know, I, I sit there and I, I talked to a friend about this and I said, you know, I'm the one who was insecure. I bought the wrong members only jacket because my, <laughs> my mom bought the full on <laughs> FOB, wrong brand all the time. And that's why I'm so insecure. And I'm the one who's like, the ostentatious person who had to buy the nice car, buy the this. I mean, look, they marketed to me because I was the insecure one, right? So now I'm using these, these coded, ostentatious displays of wealth to say I made it, right? Mm -hmm. So we are then being, I mean, to a certain extent, I'm being used to wear that symbol of I made it that is part of this, you know, that group that, probably is not including me. It's kind of like, you know, right. it, it can right. work to solidify the hierarchy. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, and so there's a certain amount of frustration I have when I sit there and I see people and I think, you know, they're buying your money, but they're not helping you. I mean, well, there's certain brands that I will never buy. I will only buy secondhand. I will never buy. If, if, if I appreciate the good, if I'm like, Oh yeah, that's well designed. I will, I will but support then, the secondhand market, but I would never support, I would never, I certainly would never go in and pay full price, never at certain brands. But the thing is, how do you control, like, you can't control that, you know what I mean? Like, there are so many people who have, I mean, even amongst black people, there, there were so many different conversations going on around the thing with Gucci about like, you know, some people are, some people are mad that, <coughs> excuse me, some people are mad that Dapper Dan did a, um, that deal with Gucci following their kind of flub or whatever. And I listened to this interview with Dapper Dan where he was like, but this is how you change it. Like you change it from the inside out. Like you got, so and and my, my point is to say, is Gucci, I, Gucci wear, you know, and I, Donald yeah. Glover, you know, like, right. There's, right. Like, but this are, and everyone has different opinions on these things. And I don't know if we're ever going to get to a place where we're going to be able to decide. And we keep saying, you know, Black people aren't monolithic. Well, no people are monolithic, oh, yeah. really. So how do you, I, I don't think that you're ever going to, and it's the same thing for me. Like I, there are certain things in terms of like the racial stuff, there are certain things that bother me more, bother me less or whatever mm -hmm. when it comes to these brands. And um, a lot of times it's because I'm kind of thinking like, okay, these people are like, you know, European in Italy, in these places where I'm like, do they actually know? 
what they're doing or are they just kind of ignorant and that's more the problem like I don't know but there are things that that I stick by when it comes to say sustainability like I don't buy fast fashion but I can never put the onus on like every consumer to not buy fast fashion because there are people who just don't have the same moral feelings about that that I do but they may have other moral obligations that they don't. You have to put on the brand. That's the only thing you really can do. Mecca, I agree with you. I don't, by no means do we all have to be on the same page. I will say that there's a disproportionate within the black fashion community. There's mm -hmm. a disproportionate amount of high visibility individuals who ascribe to the, the only way to make changes from the inside. And it is my assessment that, the, that everyone has a price and too many people's price is too low. So it's not that I think that everyone has to be on an extremist boycott page at all. That said, I do think that the changes that are being made in the broader sociopolitical landscape for Black people in America today mm -hmm. are about dismantling, not about like, so we need both. We need people, we need professors, in leading universities that are black identified, making more equitable space for black students. We need mm -hmm. CEOs in companies mm -hmm. doing their best to make more equitable space for black people. And then we need people on the outside that take these companies to tasks and these institutions to tasks in the ways that they're failing. And what we really need is that those within the inside, when those outside raise their voices, don't malign them and say, oh, you're, you, you don't have what it takes to be in here anyway, and what right. you're doing is counterproductive. We need all of us to, as long as it is evidenced that the work is going to move Black people into a space of equitable opportunity, I will support it. I will support that which I see as doing that, what I will take to task, and just ask questions about is what I deem now to be this tokenism lottery system, where you see people getting opportunities and you're like, interesting that they went with that designer for a collab because they don't really sell a ton. And mm -hmm. I don't really see them having the impact of this other person. That's mm -hmm. odd to me. And I, and I really think the power dynamics are, are, are important to vet there yes and i and i think that there's just to build on what you just said i think there's also one other element which is we're constantly having this conversation because the only brands that are in this high fashion luxury category are brands that are european or white owned because all of the brands just statistically speaking all the brands that are um you know, billion dollar corporations or a part of these or, or even in the millions are brands that were started in the 1950s and sooner or, or in earlier. Sure. So we're still coming out of a period where like we're adjusting for brand fashion being part of a world that was segregated and that said only these people have access to power and have access to um, something, even like something like creativity. I mean, that really, to, to take your life's work to be a creative pursuit even is a privilege that a lot of people of color have not really had until more recent years. So now you see a lot of color um, people of color that are in design and that are in fashion and a lot of these brands that are coming up and that have, you know, even if they've been around for 20 years, even 30 years, like it's not long enough for them to really be able to be able to compete with the Gucci's and the Dior's and the Vuittons of the world. Like it's just, and I think that and that's but, something I think we have to like address. And as yeah. that starts to change and as these brands, and I think that's what you're saying is as we give these brands more space and more support, they can start to, we can get out of these conversations of how do you change the old guard? And we can just start actually doing that work with, new brands and people who are forward thinking, you know what I mean? I, two things really quickly. I, I agree with what you said. I personally have a, a times up analogous imperative that this not be strung out any longer. 
And the other thing I wanted to point out is that I think that even in this conversation, we may have been kind of binary in our perspective on race, but I think Jeannie is an example of someone who can be packaged at times as a model minority, but owns her influence to make change in these conversations. And so we need people that are identifying outside of blackness, but not in whiteness, as Jeannie does, owning their ability to move this conversation productively mm -hmm. forward. You know, it's interesting because just recently, my daughters and I were talking about Basquiat mm -hmm. and how they were so offended because Chris Rock just got a, a crown tattoo and mm -hmm. then his daughter had the crown, but with the dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Do you know the whole Basquiat, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the very famous image? And the magazine that wrote about it said, um, oh, how cute, she added a dinosaur. And my daughter said, oh my God, that they did not even understand that. And then when we watched this documentary a while ago about him, how the museum curators were frightened by him. Yeah. And yet, mm -hmm. the most expensive piece of art, contemporary art that's ever sold on auction was his piece. Has now, you know, it's, it's globally known and accepted that his artwork was genius and beyond. And what really bugged me was this, well, his parents were ambassadors. Of course, he had an international point of view. And it was like, let's go ahead and elevate him into, no, he was genius. Don't try yeah. and go ahead. So but his biggest threat was perhaps that he was going to shift how people saw black New York artists, mm -hmm. that that was going to shift it big time. So my point is when I compare him as well as Obama, sadly, as a person of color, you have to be exceptionally, you have to do 185% to get 50% credit, essentially. Yeah. Um, I'd like to think that it's great that okay, what you're doing, like you are the stretcher. Like when I compare it to, I know this sounds so silly, this sort of an analogy, but pizza, when you are stretching the pizza dough and, and it looks like it's so easy, you don't want it to tear, right? Mm -hmm. We want to just keep stretching the dough so we can widen the circle mm -hmm. without stretching it. But it takes a little bit of suppleness, a little bit of finesse, so we can widen that circle. And mm -hmm. I feel like we're getting there, but a lot of it is acknowledging the zanias, people who are making the efforts, mm -hmm. as well as you have to be the person though that stretches, you're the stretcher. And then there's a person who's supplely like massaging it to make it, easier to stretch. So I'd like to be one of the people who hopefully is like subtly, you know, softening things. Yeah, and and that's stretching. also like, that's, it's like you have to have, I like your pizza analogy, by the way, that's, that's helpful. Um, but I think it's like, you have to have the Martin Luther Kings and the Malcolm X's, you know what I mean? Like you need both at the same time. And the John Lewis people who are willing to say like, let me come to the table and like, let's have a conversation and figure this out from the inside out. And then you need the other people who are like, you know, I'm not going to take it anymore. So it's like you need, and then you need the bigger structure to eventually realize the equity for these people while they're still alive. Right. Yeah. You, you guys, know? we're totally up on time. And I'm so bummed because this conversation is so good. I mean, wow. Um, this has been such a great, positive, amazing conversation. And I thank you so much for you guys being part of it. You're such leaders and I, I just really appreciate you. I know everyone listening appreciates it. And thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Okay, you guys have a good day. Bye. Bye.